Good evening, everybody. My name is Anna, and tonight I'm hosting the lovely Emma Bradley, um, who's going to be chatting about how she writes a first draft. Uh, so that is more than enough from me. Let's get straight to it. Emma, over to you. Thanks, Anna. Hi, everyone. Um, just to apologise before we start if my dog starts barking because he's waiting for my other half to get home and uh, he thinks we're being invaded. So apologies in advance for that. Um, so just to introduce myself, I'm the author of The Trouble with Fairies and uh, when I'm not writing, I'm either doing uni work, working, um, housework, looking after my dog, washing up. And that is rule number one of how to write a first draft, because there is always something that's going to come up to stop you from writing. So if we can have the first slide, please, Anna. OK, so the way I and I have to stress and I will stress this all the way through, everyone is different. So I'm going to go through basically how I do it and also throw in a little bit about um, how you might else want to do it but um, the first thing that I tend to focus on is the three P's so person plot and place um, this is basically the skeleton of the story which is how you're going to get your first draft so focus on things like when when is this story being written um, is it set in the 1700s on a pirate ship is that going to affect you know the dialogue things like that as you're getting all these ideas together is it uh, modern day is there slang um you know and it doesn't actually matter if these things change as you go it's literally just to get this kind of gem of an idea started um so that you can begin to write stuff down uh what is it um that may change you may start off with a romance and end up with a horror or a horror romance. Um, the trouble with fairies, for example, started off as dystopian and actually kind of morphed into fantasy adventure. So be prepared for stuff to change. But um, most importantly is who is your character going to be? So the best thing to do with characters that I usually do is literally just sketch a little bit about the character that's in my head right down um, roughly what they look like, um, what would they do in situations, and uh, you can actually find um, online, you know, character questionnaires and things like that, so if you find things like that fun, you can actually do one for your characters, you know, do they prefer Pepsi or Coke, what would they do in this situation, um, and villains are just as important, perhaps not at the start, but what obstacles are they going to put in your character's way? You might want to actually think of your villain as almost as important as your main character because they're going to keep coming up. And where, where is it set? You might not have a full idea, but usually what I do with these, the fantasy world, if I'm writing fantasy, it comes first. If I'm not writing fantasy, it, it tends to come last. Um, so find a few bits of where you're going to set it and again that may change so you may want to set it in the middle of the forest but then that becomes a fantasy forest um, it may be a high street and then you kind of have the high street in the first chapter and end up in a school for the rest of the book absolutely fine but what this does is it basically gets your mind thinking about the wider story which will then help you figure out your plot and also kind of figure out what's happening throughout the story and also your why why are these events happening to the character and why does the character care um, that will likely evolve as you write through the story um, so you could have someone that decides they don't want to move um, their family's moving they don't want to move they start at a new school they make friends um, their character motivations will be you know, essentially worrying about whether they're going to make friends at their new school. Um, so you need to also think about why don't they want to move? What are they leaving behind? Why are the parents moving them? You know, is, is there some kind of family secret maybe? And it's all about just knitting these little ideas together so that you eventually form 
what you're going to write. And if we have the next slide, please. So you've got your idea. Now what? You basically have to write it. And this is where we come unstuck because it's all very well and good to say, OK, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to write this book. But then you actually have to write it and you have to sit down and you have to dedicate all this time. Imposter syndrome creeps in. So it's just a few little tips to um, kind of help us get through that, because as someone who's written more than a few awful, awful first drafts, um, you get to that stage, I think it's about 10,000 or 20,000 words where you're thinking this is never going to work. And, you know, that is always something you need to push through, because even if eventually you decide the story isn't going to go anywhere, you can use bits of it for future stories or you can kind of draw on that to use that experience. So remember that everyone has different abilities, speed, time, etc. So with me, I usually tend to draft sporadically. So I'll do, if I've got a Saturday where I've got nothing on, I'll do 3000 words and then I might not write for a week. Other people I know can get up um, first thing in the morning at five o'clock, which as much as I love people that I know who get up at five o'clock, I, I will never be able to do that in a million years ever, not for anything in the world. Um, so basically, just go at your own pace. Remember that what you do with your 200 words or your 1,000 words, someone else might well be doing, you know, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000. That's irrelevant. You focus on your own lane. So <laughs> I've just seen that pop up, Emily. Five o'clock is night, not in the morning. Yeah, agreed. <laughs> yeah, OK, I think I think we're agreed on that one. Um, and also, not everyone has the same amount of time. You know, not everyone has the same ability to kind of like pop ideas. And that's one that doesn't get talked about a lot. Sometimes it takes a long time to let the story brew. Um, I've, I've had incidences where I've had a story, it's popped into my head and it's kind of been, that is first draft perfect. So I write the whole thing and it's usually over, I don't know, a couple of months and I'm literally just, that is all I do. And then I've had other stories like Arcanium was one of them, the um, first Arcanium book, um, Trouble with Fairies. It took about six months to get the first draft. And then the first draft is absolutely nothing to do with the book that I've got now. So that first draft is kind of, you know, it will come when it comes. Um, moving on, ask for help. This, this is so important because we kind of think of ourselves as we're writing this story. It's only a first draft. I don't know what to do with this character but I have to figure it out. Hang on to your writing friends as much as you can, because even if it's not necessarily about the story, you might hit that 10,000 or 20,000 word barrier and be like, oh, it's absolutely hopeless. You'll just have someone there to go, no, remember this happened with the last one, or remember I went through this. And it's just a case of you know going to someone to have a moan sometimes. My characters are complete and utter you know, what do I do with them? So ask for help if you need it and set realistic goals. Um, if you're saying to yourself, OK, that person does a thousand words a day. So if I do that, I'm going to have a book in 50 days, which is less than two months. And then I'm going to query it. And then you might not be able to do a thousand words a day. You might have kids, you might have responsibilities, you might have like be balancing you know, all the responsibilities in the world. So figure out what your realistic goal is and stick to it. Because if you can only do 200 words a day or even, you know, 500 words a week, that's still words towards your total. That's still words towards finishing your first draft. And that's, you know, even finishing a first draft, actually getting yourself to that finish line is an amazing achievement. So just make sure those goals are realistic. 
Uh, and again, make your time expectation sensible. So as we've discovered with the uh, 5 a.m. club that apparently none of us are a part of, um, there's no point saying I'm going to start getting up at five in the morning because my mate does it because it's not going to happen. I've tried. Trust me, you're just grumpy for the rest of the day. It happened once. It's not happening again. So, you know, even if you snatch 100 words on your phone while you're waiting to pick up your kids or you're in the vet waiting room or um, you're on a train, you know, I do that on my phone all the time. I, I literally just type down an idea or the next 50 words. Nine times out of 10, it'll all get changed, but it's keeping that momentum. So just make sure that you're fitting bits in when you can and not expecting too much. And uh, remove the stress. This, I mean, it's easier said than done. You know, we've all got life stress and writing as much as we love the story that we've got, as much as we're kind of thinking, you know, okay, I really want to finish this. I've said I'll finish it. I've told all my friends then they want to know when I'm finished writing this. Um, you know, don't put those stresses on yourself. You'll finish when you finish. As long as you keep going, you will finish. So don't put all the stress. I mean, some people don't tell anyone that they're writing until they're near the end. Other people like me go out and go, oh, I've got a new one. I'm doing this one and then I'm doing that one. Oh, I've got a new idea. And then everyone's like, what happened with that one? So, you know, just kind of judge your barriers and take the stress out of the writing, which brings us on to the next slide. Playtime, and this is my favourite one, apart from the picture of the Kraken on what I think is the final page. That's my favourite image, but um, as you can see, the pirate Kraken is having a brilliant time. Um, ask yourself, what's interesting, unique and catchy about your idea? Because at the end of the day, you do not have to write this story. You do not have to write a single word but you're doing it because you want to, because you have an end goal invested in this. Whether you want to just do it for yourself, whether you want to learn a new skill, whether you want to practice, whether you want to be the next Neil Gaiman, um, whatever your reasoning, this first draft is where you can actually get to play with your story. Um, imagine you've just written uh, someone that can breathe fire and then it turns out to be a 17th century pirate high seas drama. Um, could work, could actually work if you go down the fancy route, or you could lift out the fire wielder, put him in a different story entirely, and then you've got two stories, but also, you know, you're not losing anything. So figure out what's interesting about your story. Why, why does it interest you? And it doesn't matter what readers are gonna think at this point because the story is gonna change through editing, but why do you care about it? You know, what makes you want to write it? Pick that, focus on it, expand on it, you know, do mind maps or if you're lucky enough to be arty, I'm, I'm not. Um, you know, draw little pictures, you know, make make all your character art and stuff. This is the time where you can actually have a lot of fun with it because you can do anything. You can literally put like, um, I don't know, rainbow ponies on clouds. Do, do whatever works, just have fun with it. Um, what can you do to make the process more enjoyable? So some of the time I have a playlist I'll make like play different playlists for different um, stories that I'm writing. Uh, it's it's basically all instrumental fantasy type music, but they go on, you know, go in different ones. Um, cake, cake's another great one. I know Anna will agree with that. But um, figure out what you can do to kind of make yourself turn up and write those words. Um, I remember when I was, when I used to teach yoga, we used to say, do whatever it takes just to get yourself to your yoga mat. And then the rest will kind of naturally follow. When you don't want to go to the gym, the hardest thing is to actually get out the seat, put the trainers on and get there. Um, I don't know why I'm using all sports kind of fitness terminology because I haven't done fitness in a very long time. 
but still um figure out what you need to kind of enjoy the process of writing have your playlist have like a nice coffee um get rid of the kids and the dog and the husband and the wife and the whoever do whatever you need to do to actually make this your time even if it's only 15 minutes here and there um you know have fun with it uh and the big one this is a big one use it as an excuse to read more and this is where i'm going to embarrass myself horribly because the more i write the less time i spend on reading uh, my i won't show you my um tbr pile because it's there's there's a load of stuff in a way but um it's it's a it's a closet full so read more because while you're writing while you've got your own idea and that's kind of the spark that you need to cling on to um the more you read the more you'll get an idea of like what bits you like what bits you don't like what kind of voice and phrasing and i know there's a lot of worry that you're going to end up copying someone else's voice but if you're writing something you love and something that you're actually really passionate about it's not going to happen I think when that usually happens is if you end up writing something that's not not something you want to write so like imagine someone says to you I need you to write about dolphins and I need it to be mostly factual and I need it to be this many words and you're thinking not really what I want to write about but okay so you go and you learn a lot of stuff about dolphins and you read dolphin books and dolphin fiction I'm hoping there's dolphin fiction out there but anyway so you're reading all this stuff and then you just kind of try and emulate it to get the story out the way so that's why it's so important at this stage to kind of play and have fun and hang on to that spark of what you want to write even if it changes later because it's that that comes through in the writing so if you love it that that's basically what we mean by if you love it we're gonna love it because it will come through in kind of how the how the voice comes out and the voice is your natural way of showing us what you love and why you want to write about it so the more you read if you're writing about something you're really passionate about um you're only going to improve your ability to use dialogue use punctuation um Get rid of all the justs and the varies from your sentences. <laughs> that one's for Anna because I always get told off for the amount of um, justs and varies and smalls and larges in my um, in my work in progress. So um, also think about what do you want to get out of this. So that's not obviously we all want to be famous we all want to make money out of our writing um, even if we just want to do it for fun because let's face it stories are fun and money brilliant job done but what do you want to get out of this particular story do you want it to be funny do you want it to be scary do you want it to make people cry authors love making people cry i still haven't figured out why that is but yeah we'll get there um so think about what you want to get out of this particular story um and again that kind of goes back to the the spark and the passion of it but it's it's more about also thinking about target audience do you want to get a kid's story out of this or is it starting as you're drafting to sound like it's more adult we've got an awful lot um, of stuff going on in the young adult section at the moment um which is basically saying yeah okay which is basically saying um some of the stuff that's being written for young adults isn't actually suitable for young adults um, because it's hitting a little bit too high for the age range. Um, so you've got to think if it's starting to sound like, let's say you're writing middle grade and it's starting to sound a bit kind of teen young adult, um, think about that and say, do I want to start going down to middle grade, you know, in, in terms of age? or do I perhaps make this a young adult and then I can include slightly more of this or slightly more of that or perhaps it's a young adult and you're thinking actually the voice is coming out quite innocent um, so maybe if I take that bit out I can add more you know of that magic and wonder of this kind of thing in 
Um, and these are the kind of things that you think about as you're drafting. So the story might change. You might have to delete a couple of bits. You know, if you're deleting words, fine. If you're deleting ideas, don't. Um, if you've got a character that you really like, but it doesn't fit, take it out, copy and paste it into a Word document or Scrivener or whatever you use. Um, and just save it, save a document full of all the bits that you love that you can't really keep with that story because nine times out of 10, unless you're only writing for the purpose of writing this one book, it will come around again, um, which is kind of what happens with um, the trouble with fairies. I ended up writing the story completely differently um, and then changing the whole thing because the supporting character had a much stronger voice um, but then some of the stuff that I used in that first draft, which completely changed in the book that we have now, um, has gone into later books, plural, which might be, might be a little bit of a slip there. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's all about kind of think, what do you want to get out of this? Do you secretly want to write a series? Because if you're thinking like, oh, well, I'll just write this book and see how I go. But you're thinking like, oh, this could be a trilogy. Yeah, if I can do this, if I can pull this off, if I can be good enough, get rid of that. Do just get those ideas down and, you know, have fun with it. Get as much as you can out. And then you can start thinking about, you know, I want to get a trilogy out of this. OK, so maybe if I put that in book two. You know, and these are all things that you can be thinking. You don't necessarily need to draft them now because you're working on that first draft. But the more your mind starts to think about it and the more you play with all these different ideas, the more all these different documents are, in my case, like an entire folder full of random documents that have very weird names. Um, the more it starts to build up and then the only trouble is finding where you put everything. But, you know, just just play with what you've got. Have fun with it. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. What if the story isn't any good? So read the little explosion thing for me. Read it again. Read it again. And I won't make you do it 10 times, but it, I mean, read it like 60 times if you have to. Um, a first draft is not meant to be good. It's not meant to be a work of art or a work of literature or a work of anything. It's you telling yourself the story. So it doesn't matter that you don't know what that castle looks like yet. It doesn't matter that it's a, you know, it's a big historical or, you know, fantasy epic and it's only 35,000 words. You know, again, this one started off as 35,000 words. And now I think it's 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 at like 71. So all of the stuff can be added in later. All of the stuff can be amended. It's just you telling yourself the story. And uh, yes, I, I had to kind of amend the Tolkien quote ever so slightly, but drafting is just the first step, one that we all must take. And that's basically it. It's your first step. It's you getting the story down and telling yourself this is what basically happens. And don't worry too much about it being perfect. Don't worry about the grammar. Don't worry too much about the dialogue um, or the punctuation or anything like that, because at the end of the day, I'm sure if, if, if we've got anyone um, like extensively published in the chat, they'll tell you, you can do your first draft. You can do a second draft, third and fourth, you edit. You edit again, you get an editor, the editor tweaks it, you get an agent, the agent tweaks it and then sends it off to a publisher and the publisher's editor tweaks it again. It's going to get tweaked, so don't get hung up on, you know, whether the comma's in the right place or, you know, this is pure, first drafts are purely about the ideas. So it doesn't matter if the story isn't any good, if it's got a spark of that kind of I really love this character. I really love this location. And I really love the tension in this story. So basically, again, going back to your three Ps, person, plot or place. I, I can't remember my own my own um, acronyms. Um, if it's got those, everything else can be worked on. 
because at the end of the day that's that's all we're looking for from stories we want a character we can root for we want a plot that kind of keeps us gripped and you know throws obstacles in their way and we want a place that we can eventually visualize so first draft not meant to be good get it done have fun with it uh next one please Okay, so quick tips. This is basically just me summing up, um, but find your process. So again, it doesn't matter if you can only do 200 words a week. It doesn't matter if you need to be hanging upside down from your banisters like a bat writing upside down. It doesn't matter if you need three slices of cake before you start. That's actually a very good idea. I might adopt that one. Um, Find your process, find what works for you, find what makes turning up to your computer and your Word document or Scrivener or whatever you use. Find what makes writing possible for you. And just keep getting those words down because even if it's 50 a day or 50 a week, eventually they will all add up. It's, it's kind of like the, the calorie deficit thing I've been trying lately, which hasn't been going well. Um, but basically if you, eat less calories than you burn, you lose weight. I think that's the way it goes. Anyway, you can see how well I'm doing at that. Clearly I can remember um, what needs to be done. Um, so, but just focus on getting those words down. So the easiest way to do that, and I love this, I can't believe it took me until like three years ago to kind of think of this, well, it wasn't me think, thinking of this idea, but obviously I saw it and thought, oh, that'll work. Leave yourself notes. And I like the little crocodile um, mouths because it just looks cool. Um, let's say I don't know what the castle looks like yet. I can't visualise it. I don't know if it's got a drawbridge. Just inside the little crocodiles, just put describe castle, move on. Write the bits you want to write and then come in and fill the rest later. So again, that's probably why you end up with 35,000 words of what will be a 70,000 word um, story because you're essentially cutting out bits and not everyone can do that I know there are some people that kind of like to plan everything and have every bit designed and that's absolutely fine because that's your process if that's your process stick with it describe everything but if you're t let's say you're typing dialogue and you're thinking like oh I can't you know I've got the castle written down but I you know it's going to take ages to type that just put adding castle description, you know, and, and soldier on with the bit that you've got momentum to write. I know some people literally most of their first draft is dialogue. Other people, kind of like myself, who do the world first, end up, you know, describing this whole world. And it's like, oh, yeah, we probably should like actually throw in some people at some point and have them talk to each other. So just kind of leave yourself notes. And that will make it a lot easier to um, then go back because you can just search, you know, for the little crocodiles and then go through and add bits in when you're when when your draft is done. And keeping the joy of the story is is literally just a reminder to find that spark and stick with that. It doesn't matter if it's any, you know, if the grammar or the dialogue or whatever, it doesn't matter if it's any good. But as long as you love the story that will come out in the writing. So just kind of keep the joy of it. Um, don't go based on trends either. Unless you really, really want to write the next vampire epic, don't see something on Twitter saying vampires are coming back, which I saw and I did exactly what I'm telling you not to do. And thought, oh, I wonder how quick I can write a vampire book. Um, don't do that because if it's not what you already want to write, you'll probably lose motivation and kind of be like, yeah, well, it's all right. But, you know, what I really want to write about is like fantasy pirates. And then you're kind of, you know, you'll lose momentum that way. Shush. Um, and finally, find your writing family and cling on tight. I can't stress that one enough. That is probably the most important thing that I can tell anyone. Um, because there are going to be so many times where you feel like giving up and as much as like your family and your friends and you know people you know as much as they love you I don't think they know exactly what it's like to write until unless they do it 
because we all have well-meaning people who say, oh, you just need to sit down and, you know, you just need to be in your calorie deficit. You just need to go to your yoga class. You just need to keep writing the story. But when you're in your own head or you've got imposter syndrome or, you know, you're just thinking to yourself, I'm not sure if this story is even any good. People telling you just sit down and write is kind of really really makes you want to punch people so please don't punch people um disclaimer we are not encouraging you to punch people um but you know find your writing family <laughs> i did warn you um so yeah find your writing family cling on tight and just kind of give back sometimes it's very very easy to get excited about your story and I always I always worry about doing this um that's Anna probably tell you but um you worry about saying things to people and being a burden and being like oh I'm going to them with this problem again they understand because we're all basically as nuts as each other to be doing this we do it because we love it and because it's an absolute pain in the um proverbial but your writing family understand so if you're having an issue cling on to them and give back you know as much as you kind of get out uh and the next one i think is my favorite of all the kraken butt i'm sorry i spent ages on powerpoint with the little shapes trying to make these graphics for something else and then they didn't get used so yeah i'm going with it the Kraken has his butt out. So yeah, I that's about 35 minutes. That's not not bad for me wittering on. So um, I'm happy to answer questions, by the way, like on pretty much anything writing related. Um, but if I don't know the answer, I will do my best and I'm it might be wrong. So we'll give it a go. Yeah, and we've, um, thank you so much. I feel like you've shared so much good stuff there. Um, lots of stuff to sift through, but and I have already got um, quite a few questions. So we're gonna launch straight in, um, okay. if that's okay. So um, Laura asked um, for tips on how to stick to just one book and finish it instead of switching to lots of new projects. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah, I'm <laughs> the worst person to ask for this. Um, <laughs> motivation for sticking to one project. Um, I would say actually, and this is kind of going against what a lot of people may tell you, don't deny yourself completely if you've got lots of other projects, just make one of them kind of like your major project and the other one kind of ones you dip into. Um, I know people, there are a lot of people who say like, oh, I can only focus on one thing at a time. And that's that's great because I don't know how to do that. So I would love to have that skill. Um, but yeah, if you've got, let's say you've got a young adult and a middle grade and you're kind of dipping between them, if you've got one that you think you should be finishing, um, maybe organize yourself. Like, let's say you have um, one hour a week to write. Um, write for 40 minutes, 45 minutes on one of them. And then you can use the other one that you're kind of thinking like, oh, I really want to write about this one. Use that as your reward, just kind of dip into it at the end. And if you've got deadlines that you need to meet um, or you're thinking like, well, I really need to get on with this one, then you can always use like planning time as you're doing things. I, quite a lot of the time, I like to use washing up as planning time or walking the dog. So I'll be thinking, um, you know like oh, I'm gonna do that in that story and that story and then when I come down to write I've kind of got it out of my head so that I can actually focus on the one that I'm meant to be writing um or something else entirely which is usually what, what ends up happening but um yeah I definitely say don't deny yourself entirely if um if that's the way you're going because it will just make you feel demotivated if you're thinking like I really want to work on this one but I should work on that one so just pitch your um, pitch your weight to the one that you feel like you need to focus on, but reward yourself with a little bit of the other one. I must say as well, like um, the feeling of finishing a book is lovely, isn't it? So, <laughs> or or at least finishing it before the next round of editing. But 
yeah. I kind of I try and hold on to that feeling as if I'm sort of struggling I tend to struggle about the midpoint of a first draft um and when I get to that point I kind of try and hold on to that like but if I keep going it will feel really good <laughs> yeah <laughs> so and that's that, that, that's another thing as well um which you've just you've just made me think of if you get to the end of a first draft or even if you get to the end of a really tricky scene or tricky chapter celebrate it you know it doesn't have to be reaching the end of the book even because let's say you're writing 50,000 words that's that's a lot so you know celebrate the 10,000 mark celebrate the 20,000 mark celebrate the fact that you finally figured out you know that plot hole or whatever well you don't necessarily have to shout it on social media or you know tell everyone about it if you don't want to but even if you celebrate yourself just just a little something you know reward yourself with that thing that you shouldn't really be writing at the moment or get yourself a piece of cake or you know <laughs> whatever whatever you see as like your reward because at the end of the day we're we're always so hard on ourselves mm. when we come to write because we're thinking it's not good enough I'm not writing fast enough and if we flip it and make it a positive thing as much as we're still going to have that self-doubt and the imposter syndrome and everything it's always going to be there but we can just kind of calm down the uh calm down the symptoms a little bit Cool, thank you, Jim. Um, Mary has asked, because you talked about um, using it as an excuse to read more and kind of dip into other people's worlds. Um, what do you love reading? Uh, fantasy. Uh, fantasy. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I'm an avid fantasy reader and always have been. So anything from like um, Anne Rice vampires to Neil Gaiman, Terry Pratchett, um, but also a lot of the time now I find myself drifting perhaps in the last couple of years especially more towards um, like young adult contemporary you know funny books like Simon James Green or I grew up on a lot of um, Louise Renison and something like that especially now stuff like that is such a godsend because it makes you laugh and funny stuff that it, I don't know why I'm, I'm, I'm possibly shooting myself in the foot here, but I don't know why it seems like such a hard sell because people say like humor is hard to hard to get published, but essentially it's what we it's, it's what we need right now. So yeah, I think I think yeah, fantasy, young adult contemporary. I've 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 been drifting back into classics like um, Terry Pratchett and stuff like that recently for comfort reads. I can quite happily just plod through the whole of Discworld and then start again, kind of like Lord of the Rings, but yeah. <laughs> ah, nice. And um, so we've got some questions now about writing a series. So okay. it's a two, two parter. Um, so Debbie asked if there are any tips for writing a series and then Emily asked, um, particularly around plotting and introducing ongoing characters. So if you want to start maybe with just some general tips for writing a series. Okay, so these are just tips that have worked for me. Um, I imagine people do it differently. And I think with publishing, if you sell, um, let's say you sell a trilogy, you may not have figured out all the books, you may have a, an outline, but you may have something in book one that sells and gets published and is out there. And then you think, oh, I can't make that work because I'm, I'm going to have to redo you know this because I didn't think of that and now I want this to happen so what I do with all of mine and this is kind of one of the beauties of self-publishing because you can do things in your own time you can choose um you know what what you're going to do basically um the trouble with fairies the arcanium series um I basically plotted and did like second drafts of all the books so they're all technically already written um, and I know what's going to happen. So any tweaks are going to be, you know, that scene isn't vivid enough or I want to add in this character in, in, in that book or whatever. Um, I would advise if you're not already in a situation where you're being rushed for, say, like books two, three, four, five or whatever, have a basic idea of what you want to happen in 
like books two, three, four, five, even if it's a basic outline. So um, this character is going to go off and do that. We're going to have um, that kind of world in it, or this character is going to fall in love with them, but then that person's going to get involved. Um, just kind of try and knit the basics through. So imagine outlining your first draft, the skeleton of your first draft for each of them. And even if it changes, you've got that kind of reassurance that you've thought of these specifics. So with, depending on how many books you'd write for a series, um, if you're going for a trilogy, you need to remember that, or possibly even a duology, um, you've got to remember that it tends to follow like a arc pattern. So you have the inciting incident essentially in book one, and then you'll have obviously book one's inciting incident and plot arc. But if you imagine a book as a whole with the plot, arc, you know, something happens and then the obstacles come in and then you have the dark night or the absolute rock bottom, and then you have the resolution, you essentially have the same in a trilogy or as if you were writing a series of say like seven school books, seven you know books set in a boarding school, for example, like, I don't know, St. Clair's or Mallory Towers or, or something like that. You would have the same, you or you could have the same plot in each one, essentially, it's, it's just different fluff around it. So for example, they'll go to school, something will happen, it will get resolved, they go home at the end of the year. Um, and then you just need to figure out what the different happening is in each one. Whereas if it's a trilogy, you usually have like an ongoing saga that needs to be um, fixed. And you can have that in a series as well. You know, you can have um, like the villain will kind of follow all the way through and get progressively worse. I'm just basically doing this now. Um, <laughs> just waving at people um but yeah I, I would say definitely think about your characters expiring so for example if it was a school series um you know would you would you take it all the way to college perhaps would you have like the Percy Jackson series they had five and then they did another five um with different protagonists brought in um, so that's something you could do. You could essentially build it and build it and build it. You look at the Skullduggery Pleasant books, they've been going for absolutely ever um, and they're still popular. So it's just about thinking what's best for your character, how many plots can you come up with and will the place sustain it? You know, will the villains still be relevant or will they kind of be a bit tired by then? Um, you know, maybe they give up, maybe they, <laughs> maybe they retire. Um, you know, maybe the villain decides to retire to an island in, in the middle of, you know, the Bahamas or something. And uh, that's the end of the series. But it's just about planning forward. So I'd, if you're going to do a series, I'd have a think about how you see it going, what you think you could get maybe a little bit of in each book. And then... Um, after that it's it's literally just writing them and then they'll change obviously the internal bits of each book will change but um yeah it's it's just planning for the series lovely and so you've talked quite a lot about plotting there and then um, one really specific question that emily asked is about um introducing ongoing characters so i'm going to do like another little book <laughs> um plug for you there so um in this book you've got um demi and taz and I hope it's not an, a complete spoiler to say that they'll also be in the second book. Um, and then, so how do you go about, like you've you've already talked a lot about your main character in this book. We know a lot of her backstory. Um, we know a lot of the issues she's been through. How do you then introduce her in that second book? And, and then those secondary characters as well. How do, you, how do you describe them? How do you bring them into the book? So with the second book, which will be out in May, um, I've basically gone down the line of imagine the reader has walked into a, a bookshop, picked up the second book by mistake and um, never read the first one. And they basically trotted off, started it and thought, oh, I don't understand any of this. So when you're writing the second book, you, you can minimise some things. 
so for example where you might have had um like in the trouble with fairies um there's a part where she explains why she's afraid of small spaces so in the second one instead of her having that conversation we just refer back to it so she says she you know she could I'm not going to give anything away but for example she could just say remember I have this fear of small spaces and you've seen before that mm. you know the fear and the terror um at the idea of it and maybe even a throwaway sentence of it reminded me of but so and so already knew that mm. and then you've essentially shortened it so people who are reading who've read the first book, but reading the second one, I'm like, oh God, we've already been through this. But people who are reading the second book, never having read the first book, will know what's going on without, you know, other people being kind of hit over the head with it. Yeah. So it's literally just about hair color and eye color and descriptions and things like physical descriptions. Um, I would go in again, but if you're, unless you're writing for say, chapter book maybe or lower middle grade um I would avoid he had black hair and she had blue eyes um you know work it into the description like so and so I don't know tossed their long blonde hair or whatever <laughs> that's a really bad example but um you know kind of find ways to work it in so that it's like a natural part of the story rather than you telling it and that should be true of I think like most that should be true of most writing but especially in a second book you can cut a lot of corners that way because then they've got the description but at the same time people who have read it before will just be like oh yeah and it will be in their head already so um and again descriptions of places as well um just just almost do it as if you're reminding someone who's not been there since they've been little and then people who haven't been there but their, their friend who's never actually been there before will see it as well oh I, lo I love that idea like um reminding someone of something they've not seen since they were little because it, it will have ch like changed a little bit and you kind of need to refresh their memory that's such a good idea and um, one of the things that I would really recommend doing as well is looking at a series that you a series of books you enjoy um, and seeing how they reintroduce their characters and they reintroduce places because um, it is it's it, like Emma said it's so cleverly done that people who have read the book before don't get bogged down but the people who haven't read the book before can kind of jolly along and um, enjoy it or they like truth be said they should go back and read the first one like what are they doing <laughs> <laughs> and which 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 also brings us um, back to the uh, earlier point of read more yeah <laughs> you know, read, read read if you're writing young adult read more young adult if you're writing middle grade you know read more middle grade it, it doesn't necessarily have to be fancy if you're writing fancy but you get a good idea for you know how the voices sound and how the you know how kind of tricky the dialogue is and stuff like that so yeah that's that's a brilliant one yeah um Erin has asked um are series more self-publishing territory um than traditional publishing I wouldn't, mm, I think it's tricky to get a traditional publisher to take a chance on a series, especially if you're a debut. Now, there might be uh, traditionally published authors or there might be publishers who can decry that but and basically say I'm wrong, which is, you know, fine. But I think, um, imagine, if, imagine if you're, um, imagine if I had like six books in a series and I said you had no idea who I was and I said to you please buy all six you'd be like no I'll just try number one first I might not like it publishers basically do the same because it's a business at the end of the day so whereas with self-publishing it can be kind of more of a I really want to get this story out there it might not go anywhere but I'm gonna try publishing has to look at it like this has to make us money mm. so they won't necessarily buy a series unless they're really strongly thinking we can sell this without too much problem um you know you see trilogy young adult trilogies um that were all the rage back in the day they i imagine they probably got sold as like a job lot so you know you'd pitch all three and say it's 
part of a trilogy and they take it on the basis that you're going to provide the rest of it and it's going to be up to the same caliber as book one that they've bought but the beautiful thing about self I'm trying not to sound too too kind of like yay self-publishing but <laughs> um but it does give you a lot of freedom to kind of do do things your way so if you want to publish like 13 books in a series nobody's going to stop you <laughs> if you want to um you know you've decided you you've got a trilogy and you really want to put it out there but you want to put out a book every three months a write it fully first um because the self-publishing process is quite immense when you actually have to do it all yourself but um <laughs> The best thing the best thing about it is you can write a series um and just kind of put it out there and if book one does quite well and that's where you've got to be really careful with your marketing um you will have people that will basically start asking you know oh when's book two out or is there a, is there going to be another one <laughs> and then you'll build up a very small reader base or, or possibly even a very big reader base who who kind of say okay you know we want the next one and we want the next one and then by the time they're telling people and by the time your marketing strategy has built up you're you're kind of introducing new people to book one two three and four and then they'll just go and buy the next and the next and the next <laughs> which you know i'm i'm, I'm ho hopeful for one day <laughs> but... um i've got a few more questions and we're going to do quick fire so we can try and get um through okay. them so yeah, i'm I rambling <laughs> no no you're absolutely fine but i might just like interrupt you like a very yeah. rude person um, <laughs> um so Kate has asked um where did you find your writing family uh three or four years ago um I applied to the right mentor mentoring scheme the summer program didn't get through and I found a um like a note post on the Facebook page which basically said um, does anyone want to swap stories and see what we did wrong so that was how I met Anna Ooh, and okay. um, yeah I just I stuck I stuck around with um yeah stuck around with um Anna and with Right Mentor and then you know kind of got involved well not involved with SCBWI but um you know doing stuff with their courses and it it really is just a case of see see who's on Twitter you know see who maybe Google it but, but I'm assuming most people here might be children's um, authors but if not if you're writing crime see if there are any crime groups out there Facebook groups you know kind of free writer circles mm -hmm. people who are interested in the genre that you're writing and you can usually find you know people that will eventually build to be your writing family. I'm quite um I'm quite sort of shy as well so I sort of I made friends with uh, someone called Sally through Twitter and then Emma through the Facebook page. But I, um, I, I was always a little bit jealous of these people that seemed to meet up with six other writers every week or um, kind of had these sprawling groups online. And I was like, I have two writing friends. <laughs> um, and the thing I would say is that like, I, I, for me, I looked for quality. Um, so these like, my writing friends are the best writing friends um, and you need to, <laughs> you can go out there and find your sort of best people um, and sort of it doesn't matter if there's only sort of one or two of them actually you can still shout and scream about sort of how horrible writing is together. <laughs> is yeah I mean you, you only need one don't you to be yeah. honest but yeah it's, it's good to find like you know a couple, a couple of friends that you can just scream and shout to every day yeah. about the writing and whatever. So um, three more quick questions. Um, Catherine asked, um, but basically in their story, it's sort of more of a, there's lots of challenges um, that the character has to overcome rather than a villain. Um, do you feel that you need a villain or is it okay that it's sort of more obstacles that they overcome? Yeah, so villain doesn't have to be human. It can be um, like imagine, okay, think of Life of Pi, for example. Um, he's in a boat, he's got a tiger. Um, the villain is essentially the elements, you know, he's he's coming up against obstacles. Um, that works really well for anything involving an animal or anything involving the natural terrain or possibly even, um, you know, like 
I'm trying to think. Possibly even magic. Like if you've got a character that's struggling with um, some kind of magic, it doesn't necessarily have to be a person. It can even be their own kind of self doubt or their own ineptitude. But with that, you just need, if the villain's not um, like a person coming and stabbing at them, you just need to make sure that the obstacles they're overcoming are big enough. So they have to be scary enough. If it's not a person taking away their like freedom or scaring them with something or other, you know, like a threat, the threat needs to come from whatever the obstacle is. And it, it just needs to be made kind of threatening enough, essentially. I like it. Thank yeah. you. Very helpful. Hi, buddy. Um, so um, Kate asked, I don't, I'm not sure how much research you do for your novels, but um, have you ever sort of gotten stuck in a research hole and how do you get yourself out of one? I had a very um, interesting kind of butting heads with um, a middle grade historical novel that I wrote. Um, and that was nearly 50% research. So that was research of London, research of how they talked, research of what money was used, what you know policing system happens, what sewage, when was the bridge built over the Thames. Um, yeah, for fantasy, you don't necessarily have to do as much research because you're making it up as you go along. You just need to make it feel realistic. Whereas, especially if you're writing for say school age, um, if you're going for publisher, they might want it to be accurate. Because obviously if it goes into a school and it's got like this bridge was built in 1752 and it was actually built in 13 something, you know, you're essentially telling them something that's wrong. But with research, I'd probably just see what's necessary for the like the general scenery and dialogue and stuff like that. But beyond that, unless it's relevant to the actual scene itself, you know, just do it for a bit of fun if it comes to that. But yeah, um, if, if you don't need to know when the bridge was built, like if the bridge isn't being crossed or the bridge doesn't fall down, um, then you don't need to put too much research into the bridge itself. Um, I like it. So research what you need to steer away from so much that you don't. Um, one last and, question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was just going to say, and don't waste all your time trying to make a prehistoric map of London because trust me, it does not work. <laughs> it's probably somewhere on the internet somewhere some, I don't know but it has how <laughs> long it has how long it takes to get from each place so I could time it uh, as they were moving that's getting very specific and yeah. <laughs> um, one one last question and then we will let everyone go off um um Aaron just asked have you got any tips for marketing oh the big beast that is marketing <laughs> yes um do your groundwork very early on so let's say you've got a book out in December 22. Start now. Start talking to people. Just kind of like make friends with a couple of bookshops and not in a hopefully they'll stop my book kind of way, but just pick a couple of indie bookshops that you buy from. Um, you know, just kind of talk to them, ask them whether they think there's a market for this book. You know, booksellers love to talk about books. So just open up a dialogue. Um, if you're not arty in any way, shape or form like me, have a budget and have a plan to get your graphics done for you. Um, I've tried to do my cover. I tried to do my second cover recently in like a, I, I paid for a trial of Canva and all of this thinking, how hard can it be? Do not do your own cover, please. Unless you're an artist, do not go anywhere near your own cover because it, I think Anna's seen my attempts. <laughs> they're they're <laughs> very beautiful. <laughs> no, no, they're not in the slightest. And then your cover artist will come through and you'll basically go, oh my God, how, how does she do this? Um, but yeah, marketing, I would say definitely plan ahead. That is the biggest thing. If you're going to do marketing in terms of like getting book bloggers on schedule and stuff, try and do that 
at least six months in advance at the very minimum just you know start liking their blog talking to them um, let them know that you've got something coming out in December or whenever um, and just say I'd be really keen to have it reviewed you know ARC copies so once the book is kind of done you can send them a digital copy of it um, or possibly if you're planning that far ahead you can send them a hard copy if, if you really want to um, in the hopes of a good review and um, yeah support other people is the biggest it, it, it sounds a bit kind of disingenuous but I think supporting other writers and they support you that's where most of the initial word of mouth comes from so like you're helping each other out and even if um you know even if you don't know that many people put something on social media or put something you know out there i don't think people use local newspapers as much but if it's a local thing you know make a big to do of it anywhere you can and people will actually come and talk to you you know they'll come and ask you about your book they'll take an interest so any method you can to kind of have people see something about your book, um, assuming you can either afford it or you can give back what they want from you in return. Um, so like if a book blogger says like, oh, I'll give you a review, but I want a free copy or I want you to pay me to give you a review. You need to kind of have all that worked out in advance because someone, someone said that to me just randomly on um, Instagram messaged me and said oh hi you know this looks really this book looks really good and all of this and I was like oh awesome someone wants to review it and then they put in their cost which you know fair enough that's how they make how they make money but I wasn't prepared for that and I hadn't budgeted for that so I had to say kind of like oh, I'm not actually kind of don't have that in my budget at this time and um, went went somewhere else so it's just kind of learning little bits about you know where you could put your book you know twitter instagram tiktok's taking off especially for like young adult and stuff i think there are more middle grade people on tiktok now as well and i i've heard there are kids on it so if you're a children's writer i've you know it might come across the right people book talks very popular for support if you if you know how to build a following kind of thing i'm I'm not so much doing that I just sit there and like the book top posts but um, you know I'd, I'd say for books Twitter and Instagram are probably still the front runners in social media and then yeah hit the bookshops hit the book bloggers um, not literally hit them but obviously you know um, speak to them early in advance and just just be honest just say hi I've got a book would you be interested and nine times out of ten they'll say oh I'll think about it or all oh, send me a oh and actually thinking about it sell sheet if you google book sell sheet you'll come up with and look at the images you'll come up with like a one page a4 um in, info grab about your book um all bookshops I think when you're asking them like oh could you my book's available on Ingram for example would you be willing to stock a couple of copies um if you've got a sell sheet you look professional because that's what a lot of the publishers do I think um so it's little things like that it's it's learning those little tricks to make you look like essentially you're your own publisher so it's learning to become a publisher lovely just to give the book the best chance yeah Thank you so much for all that. I feel like we've ranged far and wide um, tonight, um, but I am going to have to draw us to a close. So thank you so much, Emma, for sharing with us about how you write a first draft. <laughs> it's all right. Thank you for having me.